Your worship or your commitment is your worship. So worship part two, subheading, your commitment is your worship. Your commitment. Say that with me. My commitment commitment is my worship. Nothing works without a healthy dose of commitment. Nothing. If you are not committed to your marriage, it will fall apart. If you are not committed to your children, they will be messed up. Well, you can be committed to the wrong things. You can be committed to smoking all you want, you know. Somebody said something one day, and I've said it several times. (laughs) I'll say it again today, if you've never heard it. If God intended for you to be uh, smoking the way you are smoking tobacco and all of that, he would have made a chimney on your nose. Because God doesn't design things by accident. He would have put two holes here because everything in nature works harmoniously. So when you drag, it should just go up. Because, you know, when you put a, if you have a fireplace, right, the smoke doesn't need to be full. It just, it knows where to go. But you notice when you smoke, you have to go, you are not designed for that. <laughs> you have to force it out. <laughs> so... But I'm not condemning smokers. I'm just saying it's not healthy. It's not helpful. Okay. All right. So nothing works without a healthy dose of commitment. God shows commitment by way of a covenant. He made a covenant with Abraham. And he said, my covenant is with you. The covenant was that as long as you believe me and obey me and raise a generation that will worship me, I will bless you. I will make you wealthy. Through you will come the Savior of mankind. The covenant was in place. I've talked here about covenant once. I've shared on the power of the covenant. Worship is simply what you do. It is action. In spirit, it is inside of you. So God wants your inside to worship him. Outside, it is what you do that we can see. All that you do to glorify God. Truth is the commitment. And we're going to go into that. So let me ask you, what are you truthful to? What are you committed to? And we'll go into some scriptures. Where and what is your commitment? Nuclear family, my family. I have a family of five. I'm committed to them. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm committed to my extended family to a certain degree because this, my family comes first. I'm committed to my assignment here, my job, my career as a minister. And you probably are too. I'm committed to um, friendships. But what are we committed to? Are we committed to our finances in such a way that um, we can't do anything with it to the point where everything around us is failing and we just have to hold on to it? Are we committed to pleasure? That we have room for nothing else. Some people jump from one pleasure mountain to the other. Entertainment. The church of Hollywood. Our shows take so much of our time that we have nothing, no time for God. So I want to say this today that the Father, our Lord Jesus, will test your commitment to worship him in spirit and truth. He's going to test it. He's going to test it. So let's look at Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 27. Mark 10, 17 to 27. You'll be wondering, man, Andaza has not read any scriptures today. What's going on? Has he backslidden already? No, no, no. I'm still a Christian. (laughs) I love the scriptures. Amen? Mark chapter 10, and let's look at verse 17. He says, Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at, his, at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 
So he was tested. He failed the test because his heart was stuck, parked in the park, uh, <laughs> parking lot of wealth. But he had done everything. You see, you may be committed to coming here, doing the things, you know, serving in the church, greeting people, having coffee with people after talking, being in a but there's something that your heart is tied to that God is looking to break if we must worship him in spirit and truth. And when he asks you for it, the question is, would you say yes? The true spirit of worship is to be able to say truth, is to, be able to, to, to speak truth to everything in your life. True worship means you will do whatever he tells you to do, whatever he asks of you. You should be able to say, Lord, whatever. Some people say, oh, I'm afraid to say that because he may ask me to do something I'm not willing to. Well, the Bible says, if he did not withhold his son but gave him up for all, us all, how will he not with him give us all things? He said he has given us all things, uh, you know, that pertain to life and godliness. He has given us all things richly that we may enjoy. Why would you say no? God can't ask you for anything in order to destroy you. He's always asking you for whatever he asks because he has a plan for the future. And here's the thing. There must be an exchange. It is, nothing happens without commitment. There must be an exchange. You must come and be, and be willing to re release what he's asking for in order for him to do what he wants to do. That's how it works. If you're going to enjoy the supernatural flowing into your life, you must be willing to exchange something in the natural. That's how it works. Through the scriptures. So he was tested, but he said no. So what, what, what is it? That you have? Is it a relationship? Some people have a relationship they should let go of. But they look at all the comforts around the nation and say, well, you know what, uh, well, you know what, well, you know what. But God is bigger than that and is able to make a way. Especially where you are being hurt or where you are being abused. But it's like, well, you know, if, you know. No, you need to address it. Friend, well, you know, we've been friends since high school. Ah, no. But God was before high school. Come on. Let's look at some examples of biblical commitment. Some examples. So we see Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 to 19. Genesis 22, 1 to 19. Do you love the scriptures? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> you will say yes, right? Okay. Good. Genesis 22. It's a long passage. And, you know, I, I give this scripture so you can also, you know, read them for yourself when you have the time. Look at verse 1. It says, now it came to pass after these things that God, what? Let's read it together. Everybody want to go. Abraham. So assuming God comes to, let me pick on Denny this morning. And the Lord said to Denny, Denny! Or Marshall. And the Lord said to Marshall, Marshall! Because God knows your name. And he sometimes calls our name. You know, some people say you can't hear the voice of God anymore. It's the people of the past that had. That's not true. That's not true. God actually speaks to people. Our story of coming to Canada actually has to do with a voice in my ear. I was laying down there on the bed. My wife was already convinced. I didn't know anything. But 4.30 a.m., I was laying there on the floor, praying in our home. And gentle, quiet in my ear. But anything you hear must be tested here because you have you have what's called a, yeah. So that, that, that I, they're, they're friends of mine who still think that that's the way. But then some will ask me questions. So how do you do this? I say, oh, really? That one, you have to hear from him. <laughs> there are things that you need to hear from him for yourself. For yourself. And he chooses how to speak to you. He can speak in your spirit. He can show you signs. He can do whatever. You, you can't command him and say, if you don't speak to me this way. No, he decides. He knows you. How to speak to you. So, he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a bond offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. It's a test. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the bond offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. 
Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. Do you see the word worship there? Your worship is your commitment. Your commitment is your worship. He was committed. He was committed. Now, you, have, you are told you have a child when you are 75. Then the child doesn't come. How many years you are waiting? 25 years, finally the child comes. I mean, it will take faith. 25 years before the child was born. Now, 12 more years later, God says, okay, uh, you know what? You have only one child. I want that child. I mean, if I was Abraham, I would say, hold on a minute. Let's have a meeting. I waited for 25 years. In, the, in, the, in between, a mistake happened and Hagar was born. That's what happened to Abraham. Um, Hagar had uh, uh, Ishmael. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> what is all this? I'm tired. Is it, you know, is it, <laughs> what you are going through today is your own test. What you are going through today is the attack on your faith. Some of it is from the enemy. Why God hasn't removed it is that he wants to mature you through it and grow you through it. For all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We will have difficulties. We will have problems. Do you think Abraham's neighbors weren't laughing at him? So, uh, you know, this man, you are just getting old, no child. <laughs> Who's going to carry your name? Abe, 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 Abe. Who? Well, I don't know. Uh, family members looking at you and thinking, man, when, is it, when are things going to actually change? When you go for a meeting and you stand around, they are looking at you. You know what they are thinking in their hearts because they are your family members. We told you not to marry that woman. I told you. I told you. I told you. You see now? See? That's why you don't have... She comes with bad luck all the time. But you are a child of God. There's no bad luck around you. You are only passing through. And your story will one day be said... It also came to pass. So what happened? <laughs> so the Bible tells us that, um, verse 9, Then they came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Now I know that you fear God. Now, when people see that fear God, they say, well, what does that mean? It's not the fear of, oh, I'm so scared. Caspar the ghost is in the room. Let's move to another room. Well, Caspar the ghost is a friendly ghost. That's a, <laughs> you know, or Scooby-Doo, you know. No. The fear of the Lord is the reverence, the holy reverence of God, knowing that he is mighty, what he said he will do. And that he's not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that is what they also would reap. Get it? He said, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its thorns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a bond offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time. Friends, our worship will produce more than the offering. Our worship will produce more than the provision will require. Our offering of worship to God in consistency, in commitment, will produce an announcement from heaven over your life such that the enemy... Seeing you will know you are marked for destiny and there's nothing the enemy can do about it. The angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time. One time from God is enough. When God is calling you a second time, there's trouble for darkness. Because you don't just have light. Now you have stadium lights on you. No, the stadium lights are different than light in your bedroom. You have the lights of heaven on you. By myself, I have sworn. God does not need to swear. Says the Lord, because you have not, this is why you cannot take the covenant of Abraham away from him. And for those of us who have been married into the covenant by adoption, you can't kill us until our time. You can't take what belongs to us when the day comes, when the hour comes, when the minute comes. God is never late. It's coming on time. No matter what the world says, they are just playing games. The enemy is like a dog on a leash. Can't go as far on t except if God permits. Read the book of Job, and you see what I'm talking about. Are you with me this, this afternoon, my friends? Is it morning or afternoon? Where are we? 
<coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> All right. So we see through that scripture. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this. Because you have done this act of worship. And have not withheld your son and only son. Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your seed. Remember what I was talking about. That's why the enemy doesn't want your children. They want to change your boys to girls and your girls to boys. So that there will be no population more. They say the earth is not enough. We are running out of food. Billionaires are telling us we are running out of food. They are all liars. They should use their money to research. That you can, you can, God is so amazing. My wife took lectures we bought from Sobeys or from whatever, one of them. And after we had finished eating it, she put the lettuce inside a, a thing and it started growing. God has made it so easy. We complicate and complicate and complicate because of iniquity and transgression. Transgression, transgression. It's multiplying everywhere. Say, oh, and that, I don't talk about that. I will preach the gospel. That's why I'm called. If people don't want to talk about the things that are affecting people today, they will lose their members. The thing you are afraid of, oh, I don't know where my salary will come from. God called you, not anybody. You guys didn't call me. I was here before you got here. God called me. You didn't even know what my name is. So why should I be afraid to tell people what the Lord is saying? Oh, they will take their tithe away. Oh, come on. Come on. If everybody leaves and you are faithful to God, the following week he will bring them without Facebook, without YouTube, without Instagram, without slap, chat, slap, chat, chat, chat. He will bring them. One man went and sat in a store and he was praying. The Lord called him. He sat there and he was praying and praying. And he prayed for three hours. Somebody knocked on the door of the storefront and said, I was sent here to come and give you this money to pay rent for this place. Never met the man, didn't know who he was, but he prayed until he broke through to heaven. One time at church, we didn't have it, we were in serious difficulty. We're having difficulty problems. I said to my wife, what do we do? She said, we should start praying. What did we do? Some years ago, we wake up by midnight. Because we understood the principle of midnight prayer. And we pray for one hour. It wasn't easy because you're already sleeping. And you have to wake up. And we prayed. I will be walking around. She will sit somewhere in the corner of the room. And uh, we prayed. I think we did it for about seven days or so. Something like that. And there was a turnaround. There was a turnaround. There are some, some things, five minute prayer will not resolve. You need to sit in the presence of God and draw heaven into that location. Do you hear what I said? And some of you are going to do it. And when God begins to catapult you, people will say, what happened? Ah, I caught my covenant with God. Caught yours. Because it's more than, there's more than sufficient. So all these lies everywhere. It, the, the world is, the lies are increasing. The more lies there are. And you know the funny thing? The younger generation doesn't, when you say to many of them, they, they say, oh no, they get offended. 50 years from now, they'll say, I wish I had listened. How many of you today wish you had listened to some things your parents said? That's exactly what you are seeing repeating itself. History repeats itself. My prayer is that some of the young ones today will be the leaders of tomorrow. Because they will have much grace to lead. God said, because you have done this, in blessing I will bless you. Me, I want also heaven to say, and that's because you have done this. In blessing I will bless you. In multiplying I will multiply you. Not just, the, not multiplication, people just think it's always about money. No. But, you know, I want to be able to minister to people who are hungry for truth. And I want to be a channel of God's grace, a conduit of God's grace. A, 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 you know, I want notable miracles to happen because the Bible tells me in Acts chapter 5, they could not say anything to them because a notable miracle had been done. Somebody said notable. But it was their worship that produced it. Worship. Abraham said, we're going to do our act of worship. We are going to do something over there, and it is worship. When we get there, we'll do it. It's worship. 
Abraham was committed. He was committed. Verse 19, Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Okay, second person, David was committed. He prepared for the building of the temple under Solomon. First Chronicles chapter 19, verse 3 to 9. First Chronicles chapter 19, verse 3 to 9. You know, some people say don't open too many scriptures in the church. You will confuse people. They are liars. Don't be confusing anybody. That is how the devil has lied and taught us doctrine that are useless. And people, pe people who know Jesus have no power. People who know Jesus can't pray for more than five minutes. Even five minutes is a struggle. The only prayer is God bless this food. Amen. Plus God minus devil. That's not a prayer. People need the word of God. We need, we need the scriptures, friends. So let's look at David. <laughs> Where are we? First Chronicles chapter what? Verse 19, verse 3. And the, and the prince of the people of Ammon said to Hanon, do you think that David really honors your father because he has sent comforters to you? Uh, where are we? I'm sorry. First Chronicles. Oh, sorry, Second Chronicles. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Second Chronicles. Chapter 1. Okay, sorry. Sorry, let's go from 1 Chronicles chapter 29. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. All right. So, furthermore, are you there? Chapter 29 verse 1. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 1. Now you are going to open all the verses, chapters you never open at home. So let's go. <laughs> Bible says, furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, my son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen in his young and inexperienced, and the work is great. Because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now for the house of my God. Now what do you do in the house of God? What do you do there? You come to observance of what? Worship, right? That's what you do in the house of God. So David says, he says, I have prepared. Oh, I mean, look at verse, uh, uh, verse, verse, verse 3 again. Uh, verse 3, no, no, verse 3, let's go to verse 3. He says, moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God. That's worship. I have what? Set my affection on the house of my God. Let's read it, my friends, from I have. I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I've prepared for the holy house. My own what? Special treasure of what? Gold and silver. Now, if you see the reason why he did that, it was because God told him, you will not be the one to build because your hands are stained with blood. So I want somebody else to build. You, you, won't build. You've served me, no problem with you, but the consequence of your actions, you will not build it. Somebody else will build it. He prepared. If you read the rest of it, you see what he prepared for the building. Ahead. Friends, what are we preparing for the future? That's why I said to you earlier, the enemy wants the children. But he's not getting mine. He's not getting yours in Jesus' name. Amen. He's not. Even if they've left, they are coming back. Amen. Because we will get on our knees and pray until they return in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Is somebody with me today? Yeah. Hmm. God is good. Yes. Then there's Caleb and Joshua. You know what? I will slow down here. I'll just give you the example and maybe continue from there because there's a lot. Caleb and Joshua were committed in worship. You, you see, it's what we do. It's not just we come here and say, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so... Yes, it's good to sing. The singing is to bring us close to the throne. Is a song of ascent. 
to lift our spirits to unite with our Father, the Great Spirit, the Father of all spirits. And then we come from that place of ascent into a world that is so convoluted, and we can take the blessings of heaven into the world. What did Caleb and Joshua do? In Numbers chapter 14 of the Holy Scriptures, Numbers 14, you're in Bible college today, hallelujah. Numbers 14, don't get tired. We see, the Bible says, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. What were they weeping for? And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation to them said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. This is what happens to us. When things are not going well, we complain. One child is sick, we become all, oh, you know, I don't even know what's going on with this world. It's going to pass, my friends. If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader, a team leader, and return to Egypt. They were looking for team leaders even in those days. Wow. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. For they are our bread, their protection has departed from them, and the Lord who is with us do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. So, well, we go later on, we see what happens if we go to verse 22 to 24. Let's read it together, my friends. Everybody, put it up there, verse 22 to 24. Actually, let's read from verse uh, yeah, 22. This is the Lord speaking. Let's go, everybody. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. Let's go. Verse 23. They certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my what? Servant. You see this? He swore it to Abraham. He said, but my servant what? Caleb. Now, Joshua was... Uh, uh, going to be leader, right? But, but because he has a different spirit in him and has what? Followed me. He has what, my friends? A different what? Spirit and in truth. His truth was we can take it. I see the giants, but we can defeat them. I see the giants, we can win. I see the land, it's good. God's promise is true. Let's not be afraid. Let's go. I know I'm short. The giants are high, but I can defeat them. I will bring you, it says, I will, let's go, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Here's what he said. Because of the different spirits in him, God is looking for who would worship him in spirit and in truth. Honestly, I didn't even see that when I was preparing. I just saw it now. It was beautiful. You know, you are going through scriptures and you are reading and things come out. Friends, I will close by saying commitment to God flows first from love. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus? We sing, teach children the song in Sunday school. Jesus love me this I know for the Bible tells me so. Lead to, you know when I, when I was young we had all kinds of songs for Sunday school. But you know the world is getting so wicked. And one day I said to myself, when we go to movie theater we sit with our children. That's why I like to sit with my children in the church from when they are young, when they are babies. So we can watch the same movie so that they can grow up in the fear of the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that putting them in another room won't help them grow. But if you have the resources, you can do that. But you are their first resource. You are the person that they see. When you are praying at home, they see. They know where you pray. They know where your Bible is. When they get older, they open your Bible. They see all the markings in your Bible. Now, maybe at that time, we won't be having paper Bibles anymore. I don't know. But at least for now, they see. They will copy. It will, it, will, it will drop on them in Jesus' name. We love him because he first loved us. First John 4, 19. Jesus said also, if you love me, he says, 
obey my commandments, keep my commandments. And one of his commandments is that you shall not worship anything outside the law, your God. And so worship does not begin and end with lifting up our hands to him in the sanctuary. We will worship God in the sanctuary in spirit and in truth. And the truth continues outside in what we do. Because the lie is outside there. That's why you need the truth. Do you agree with me? Do you understand? Because sometimes you read the verse, what does it mean? We worship in spirit and truth. What does the truth mean? Well, the spirit means in you. The worship is coming from deep within you. But the truth is walking it out. As you go out there, you are filled with the presence of God. The Holy Spirit has anointed you afresh from the place of worship. As you go out into the city, as you go out everywhere, that grace will pour out of you. Don't begin. You know, some of us, as even as Christians, people know in our walk, the F word comes out of our mouth so easy like fish out of water. Why? Any little thing happens. Oh, boom. Oh, bang. Oh, b- no. You must grow. You cannot remain a baby Christian. It, you have to grow. It's to your own benefit and the benefit of your family that you are growing in faith. May the Lord bless you in Jesus' mighty name. What have we talked about today? We've talked about your worship is your commitment. We've seen Abraham's commitment when God talked to him and asked him, I don't know what God will ask you to do. I don't know whether God will ask you to go on the mission field for a year or for a month. or Whatever he asks. Just do. If God is speaking to you and you don't even know how to interpret it and you don't know how to, uh, you know, we are here. That's why we are here. That's why we are elders in the church. You ask questions. You say, this is what is happening to me. You know, I had a dream. Somebody said, I had a dream. I saw myself in an aircraft going somewhere and it has happened three times over the last number of years. I don't know what it means. Oh, well, here is what is happening here. And she says, oh, I never understood it. Another person came and was talking to me about something. Pastor, I don't know. I'm hearing this voice. And he's so, you know, and I'm like, okay. Immediately, I said, oh, let's pray. As I began to pray, she began to weep. The presence of the Lord came down mightily upon her. You need a prophetic voice in your life, sometimes to understand and break the the yokes of confusion that is around us. You can't do it alone. You need the help of others. I don't know whether this is the right person to marry. Come and talk to my wife. There are other senior sisters in the room who have had experience. They will pray with you. Christians will not just jump into any marriage. Oh, this is a marriage. Oh, we are now married. That's not how it works. You have to hear from God. We are different. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We have been chosen of God. And God has a plan for your life in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You are going to, look, friends, I'll see you at the top in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to see you at the bottom. I'll see, somebody say, Pastor, I'll see you at the top in the name of Jesus Christ. What is the top? A, to, a place of joy. The Bible says in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And this is the joy fountain and joy must flow for the fountain is called Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace, the one who lives forever, the one who can never lie. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Come on, shout hallelujah! God bless you. I love you, but Jesus loves you more. Amen?